probably the most tumultuous period for the Middle East since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1917. So many things are in play. We're living through history. And uh, it's unclear at this point how we could say with certainty how it will turn out. But all this has created enormous challenges for Israel as it's trying to grapple with this and navigate this new Middle East. And as, uh, as Richard said, Sahi is someone who's really been at the heart of Israeli decision making on strategic issues uh, for many years. Uh, he's also been the head of the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. He's now a member of there. He leads like the Knesset version of the, of the Rules Committee. But he is someone who, I, might, I would say in Israel, the one person I could think of who is both very close to Prime Minister Netanyahu and Tzipi Livni, who was supposed to be negotiator on the Palestinian issue, he, he's close to her as well. So I think we, we, we really were fortunate to get someone of uh, his experience and stature. I've known Saki for 30 years since uh, he was the head of the Israel Students uh, Association. I was also a student activist at the time. So I'm, I'm just delighted that he's here to be with us. And then after his talk, well, well, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll turn it over to you. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, member of Knesset, Saki Anegbi. Thank you, Rob, for inviting me. Thank you, David. Thank you, Richie. You almost pronounced my name correctly. I can tell you that uh, it's a good achievement. These two letters, Tzachi, do not exist in English. I am married to, a, I'd say, a girl from Florida. We are married for 30 years. Her mother still calls me Kaki. So, uh, <laughs> so it's a definitely progress. And uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for inviting me. I wanna, I'm happy to be here today. It's an uh, invitation to speak before such an esteemed uh, audience is always uh, is honor to me. The reputation of the Washington Institute is recognized inside the beltways of both Washington DC and Jerusalem and I'm honored to be here. In the next 20 minutes, I would like to share with you my views on the national and foreign policy dilemmas facing Israel in the months to come. But before diving into the most pressing issues of the day, namely Syria, the Palestinians, Iran, I want to illustrate the historical context in which they can be viewed. In November 1947, it's 10 years before I was born. The United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of the creation of the State of Israel. Tens of thousands of Jews took to the streets in spontaneous uh, celebration, overwhelmed with joy. Strangers kissed each other, hugged in the city squares, danced in the streets, waved the flag of the as yet unborn country. But not everyone took part in this outpouring of bliss. My mother, then 22, now she's 87 and one of the most admired uh, public figure, figures in Israel. She was serving also in the Knesset for many years. At the time, she was one of the daring fighters in the Irgun underground movement who opposed the British rule. Yet on the eve of the renewal of the Jewish sovereignty in our ancient homeland, she wrote this in her autobiography. And that's a quote. From a rooftop in downtown Tel Aviv, I watched the crowd with an empty heart. The United Nations approved a Jewish state without Jerusalem, without Hebron, without Bethlehem, without Judea and Samaria. I could not share in the joy of the crowds below. I felt only the infinite grief of a slaughtered dream. In historical perspective, those who celebrated were justified. My mother and many others would have preferred to wait until their vision of greater Israel could be fully attained. They did not appreciate 
the advantage of realpolitik over lofty dreams. But leaders must come to terms with an imperfect reality. Years may pass before the wisdom and foresight of their decisions become apparent. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, chose to accept the United States resolution, United Nations resolution, and paved the way for a Jewish state after 2,000 years of exile. Menachem Begin showed the same courage when he accepted Egyptian President Sadat's historic initiative for peace, even though it called for painful compromise. This is the time to be to welcome the nephew of President Sadat who is here with us today. His name is Anwar Sadat too. <laughs> Mr. Sadat was uh, just uh, uh, elect, was elected to the Egyptian parliament and I hope that him and I would be able to uh, cooperate in the future and strengthen the peace between our countries. Thank you, Anwar, for being here. <laughs> These two leaders, Ben-Gurion and Begin, represent a strong argument for political pragmatism. Our history, however, has also proved that such pragmatism can be ill-founded. The consequences of the unilateral withdrawal of Israel from Lebanon in the year 2000 and from the Gaza Strip in 2005 illustrate this. Many believe that the decision to withdraw has allowed for extremist militants to take over. Hezbollah turned South Lebanon into a fundamentalist Iranian proxy. Hamas turned Gaza into a terrorist launching pad from which tens of thousands of rockets and missiles and mortar shells f have been fired at innocent civilians. Hopeful pragmatism versus sober conviction. These are the dilemmas facing Israel's leadership today. We ask ourselves, how can we be sure that our absolute commitment to security does not become the barrier to peace? And how can we guarantee that our willingness to break through existing barriers is not misunderstood and exploited? <clears throat> and what are the most critical issues, those on which we cannot afford to compromise because the price would be unbearable? Israel has been dealing with such questions since its birth. In light of the current regional upheaval, they are now more demanding than ever before. With this background in mind, I'll begin with the country that has received the full attention of the world media this week, Syria. Since March 2011, Syria has been caught in chaos and anarchy. The civil war has claimed the, the lives of over 70,000. Hundreds of thousands have become refugees. Unlike Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, where regimes fell relatively rapidly, Syria's inner struggle has yet to be decided. The country is falling apart, and the Islamic forces that are flowing into Syria to battle the regime have made it a jihad arena. No one can say how long the struggle will go on. I believe that the fall of Bashar Assad regime will be an important positive development for the free world, for the United States, and for Israel. Syria under Assad has become a strategic partner of Iran, Hezbollah, and the Palestinian terror organization. Their alliance is a threat to the stability in the Middle East. Despite Syria's careful avoidance of direct conflict with Israel, in September 2007, the world learned that Syria, with North Korea's assistance, has built a nuclear reactor. The reactor exposed Syria's true colors, no longer a responsible, reasonable regime, but a force for profound instability. Syria sold its soul to the most radical forces in the region. As was the case with the nuclear reactor, the Middle East will be better off when the murderous Syrian regime is gone. Of course, such development will not be devoid of negative consequences. 
Syria may become a focal point for Islamic terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda. Muslim Brotherhood may gain political power and become a central force in the country. The relative calm that Israel has enjoyed along its northern border for decades may be disturbed. Assad's fall will also increase the danger that the Syrian army's advanced weapon system will fall into the hands of terrorist elements in Syria and in Lebanon. According to international media, such a danger has already forced Israel to take preemptive action. Obviously, I'm not going to discuss who was responsible for the recent strike in, in Syria, but I do want to say something about the reasons speculated upon by the media for why Israel might have been responsible. <laughs> I didn't smile. The theories that Israel attempted to intervene in favor of the rebels or to send the United States the message that if you don't act, we will, are, in my opinion, absolutely untrue. Israel has no interest in becoming embroiled in the internal struggle, nor would it use such means to encourage an ally to do so. If it were true that Israel performed airstrikes in Syria, its only, its only purpose would be to prevent the delivery of advanced game-changing weapons into the hands of terrorist organizations like the Hezbollah. It is safe to assume that as Assad's chance of survival diminish, Hezbollah will increase its efforts to take control of strategic arms, including unconventional weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and advanced Iranian missiles. While these consequences pose security risks, on the strategic level, the downfall of the Syrian regime will deliver a severe blow to Iran and its proxies. In the short term, the fragile status quo of the last few years will be shaken. In the long run, Syria's removal from Iran's orbit will greatly increase, increase the chances for true stability in the Middle East. There currently seems to be no internal force in Syria capable of ending the inhuman massacre. Therefore, the importance of dialogue and cooperation between the regional countries, Israel, the United States, and Europe, is all the more vital. In the Palestinian arena, we need to restart the constructive dialogue with the Palestinian Authority after long years of standstill. The impasse has had many causes. The gap between the parties' positions still remains deep, even after decades of diplomacy. The division among Palestinians following the takeover of the Gaza Strip by Hamas has led Israelis to doubt Abu Mazen's relevancy as a reliable partner. The confidence in Abu Mazen has been further eroded by three developments. One, the fact that Israel's initiative to freeze construction in the Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria for 10 months did not bring about a change in the Palestinians' preconditions. Two, the reconciliation agreement signed two years ago in Cairo between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. And three, the unilateral initiative by the Palestinians last November to be accepted as a non-member observer state in the UN. Despite these difficulties, I believe the conditions are ripe for a new attempt at breaking the deadlock. The elections in Israel, and in the United States are behind us. The makeup of Prime Minister Netanyahu's new government signifies a more moderate approach than the previous one. President Obama has entrusted Secretary of State John Kerry with bridging the gap between the parties and he has already demonstrated an ambitious and serious approach. This is why Tsipi Livni is not here and I represent Israel here. They're making a lot of uh, discussions and the Secretary of State is pushing and trying to find the common denominator between the sides. The main reason for my careful optimism is that the two-state solution is widely accepted among both Israelis and Palestinians. Prime Minister Netanyahu publicly supports the idea while also emphasizing 
the necessary conditions for this vision to be viable. These conditions are not easy for the Palestinians to accept. Recognition of Israel as a Jewish state, the end of the conflict and of all mutual claims, strict, strict security conditions and principles, including demilitarized Palestinian state, renunciation of the Palestinian demand for the return of refugees into the state of Israel, and the preservation of large Israeli settlement blocks as part of a land swap agreement. I should emphasize that these are conditions for a viable agreement, not preconditions for negotiation. While the task is daunting, both sides are keenly aware that time is not in their favor. Many Israelis understand that the lack of a progress in the peace process might lend legitimacy to the one state idea which contradicts the vision of a Jewish and democratic state. Many Palestinians now realize that their successful maneuver in the UN has limited value. Their independence can be achieved only on the basis of direct negotiations with Israel, which will lead to an historic compromise that both sides can live with. My view is that the government of Israel needs to do all it can to help the American effort to bring both sides back to the negotiating table. There are unacceptable Palestinian preconditions whose purpose is to determine the outcome of the negotiation before they even begun. But there are also confidence building measures that Israel can implement in order to enable Secretary of State Kerry Kerry's success. It will be, after all, not only his success, millions of Palestinians and Israelis are hoping for it. We must give it a chance. And finally, Iran. In the past, there have been doubts as to the character and goal of the Iranian nuclear program. Perhaps the only positive development since this crisis began is that the differences in intelligence assessment have largely been ironed out. Today, all the leaders of the free world recognize that Iran's goal is to acquire a military nuclear capability, and that this goal is close at hand. We must admit that we are nearing the moment when the major players will have to make difficult decisions. The need to decide looms first and foremost over Iran's leadership. Other major decisions will be derived primarily from theirs. Some analysts believe that the identity of Iran's next president could influence its policy. I think that it's a naive expectation. In Iran, strategy is determined by the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and he is not going anywhere on June 14th. This is the day of the coming elections. Khamenei has had many opportunities to reach a reasonable settlement. Innumerable, innumerable meetings, rounds of talks, back-channel negotiations, initiatives, and mediation efforts have come and gone. Up until now, there is no indication that Iran is considering any compromise. During the past two years, the international community, led by President Obama, has managed to unite around the strongest set of sanctions yet. All the organizations that monitor these developments are in agreement. The sanctions have had a profound effect on the Iranian people and on the Iranian economy. Unfortunately, there is no sign at all that these economic hardships are being translated into policy shifts. The Iranian resolve to attain the ultimate weapon of mass destruction has not been curtailed. The only time that Iran has ever halted its determined strive for the bomb was in 2003, when Iranian leaders feared they would become the third target in the United States' war on terrorism following Afghanistan and Iraq. It is therefore clear that a credible military threat could have a real influence on Iranian policy. In respect to the possibility of militarily preventing Iran from its getting its nuclear bomb, Israel and the United States work on different timetables. This is due largely to the difference in capabilities of Israel and the United States. 
rather than a difference in the perceived capabilities of Iran. Simply put, the United States can act effectively after Israel cannot. So, if sanctions and diplomatic efforts continue to prove ineffective, and the only options left on the table are containment or the use of force, should Israel place its fate in the hands of the United States? Can Israel be assured that its closest ally will act in due time to remove the nuclear threat? My answer is no. Such assurance can be given by no president and can be demanded by no prime minister. Israel does not and should not expect such a commitment. Israel's bond with the United States is unbreakable and the threat posed to our nations by nuclear Iran is mutual. But at the end of the day, we are each beholden to our own national security policies and priorities. Just as no president can commit to military action unconditional of his own nation's best interest, so can no prime minister forsake his country's inherent right to self-defense. President Barack Obama, during his recent visit, I would say a successful visit to Israel, reiterated that Israel must be able to defend itself by itself against any threat. <coughs> and all of us in Israel thank the president and appreciate this message of support. Thank you very much. Safi, before, uh, thank you very much for that tour de raison. I, uh, before we turn it over to the floor, uh, Rob's asked me to ask you a series of questions. So here we go. Let's start on the, on the Palestinian issue. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu last week was at the is Israeli Foreign Ministry, and he is cited as saying, an agreement with the Palestinians must be reached in order to, quote, prevent Israel from becoming a binational state but will provide for stability and security. He said economic peace is good, but it's not a substitute for political peace. I wonder if you could comment on the Prime Minister's statement and also address, also if we're talking about the Palestinian issue, last week we had Arab uh, leaders in Washington meeting with John Kerry talking about the idea of land swaps. And um, I was just wondering if we can get your comment on that as well, that land exchanges as part of a final deal. Um, so anyway, so please. Thank you, David. Uh, well, your question is exactly uh, the, the major shift in the right-wing policies in, in the, the last two, three, four years because the Likud party and most Israelis for many, many years rejected the idea of a two-state solution because we felt that there may be another solution that will not impose upon us to disassociate ourselves from Judea and Samaria, from, from, from the birth of the Jewish people. But as, uh, as we see, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, several years ago, gave what we know in Israel as the Bar Ilan speech because it was given in the University of Bar Ilan, and this is the first time that he is the head of the biggest party in the right wing, the head of the ruling party of Likud, spoke about his readiness to promote the two-state solution. And it was a great metamorphosis, in a way, it was a, a big change that we hope that will be endorsed by the Palestinians and, and em embraced by the Palestinian Authority. Later on, as I mentioned in my speech before, he uh, initiated the government decision, also unprecedented government decision that was highly criticized among the constituency that usually supports the Likud party. Uh, the moratorium of 10 months in, in, constru in construction in, in Judea and Samaria. Unfortunately, again, this gesture 
this confidence, be, uh, confidence building measure was not accepted the way we wanted it to be accepted. And the Palestinians went on with their unilateral um, agenda trying to dictate the outcome of the negotiation through a majority of the members of the United Nations uh, General Assembly. United States helped us to prevent the, uh, the effort that they wanted to be accepted as a state by the Security Council. So what happened in the General Assembly is really uh, a declaration. It's a victory, it's a diplomatic victory for them, but it's not what they wanted. And hopefully they will understand that the only way to reach an agreement is reach an agreement. It's to sit with us, to answer to our fears, to our, um, to our um, needs. We will have to answer to their desire and eventually, hopefully, we will reach an agreement. It's a long journey. I think Israel, the Israeli people, and now the Israeli government is ready to go to this path. Do you want to say any of the land swaps? Well, the land swaps is an idea, is a creative idea that is, uh, is helping both sides to get over the main obstacle, which means the issue of the borders. Israel will never go back to the 67 borders because of so many reasons that we discussed in the last four decades. I don't want to bore you again. I'm sure every one of you have been to Israel and you know and you understand. And you know where the border of 67 is passing, in the middle of Jerusalem and very close to, to everything. So we are ready to uh, negotiate the land swaps, which means that even the, the main Jewish settlement, the main the cities of Ariel and the cities of uh, Male uh, Dumim and Alfei Menashe and Kiryat Arba, you know the places, they will not be evacuated and we will negotiate with the people what will be, uh, what will be given to them in return. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, it's a new idea of the last, uh, I would say, decade and it will help us at the end to eventually reach an agreement. And it's something you think Prime Minister Netanyahu can support, right? Of course, he can support, he understands that it's, a, it's something that can be worked with. Of course, there's going to be so many debates about the percentage of, of the land, and w we won't go into it. But yeah. first, we have to sit together and discuss the issues and, and try to, not to try to dictate to each other the outcome of the, of the negotiation. Let me turn it to Syria. Israel historically has liked what Israel calls the ktovet, the address, a central address for a country, and that there's some accountability that if someone strikes Israel, Israel will strike back. Um, but people are saying that the Bashar Assad regime is not just, might not just be unraveling, but the state of Syria dis is disintegrating. And how will the state of Israel deal with all these different enclaves in Syria, if that's where it's heading, if, if Syria fragments in, into pieces, what does that mean for Israel's thinking about Syria in the future if this central state comes apart? Israel's policy in the last two years since March uh, 2011 when the whole thing began to, to uh, really uh, unfold, we decided that we are not going to be involved in any way unless we have these problems of security issues and the need to prevent that the state-of-the-art weapon will get to the hands of the Hezbollah. I think that the, most of the world is watching over Syria with the same cautious approach because nobody really knows what is going to be the nature of Syria when all this will end. And nobody wants to go and help the rebels when the rebels, forces within the rebels are Al-Qaeda forces and other jihadi uh, um, zealots, so, but there is also the humane issue and the fact that so many people are, are being massacred day in, day out. So in this, in this context, Israel is trying to not to um, go into this arena 
I just read today that uh, there is kind of understanding between the Secretary of State visiting Moscow and Sergei Lavrov, the Russian um, foreign minister, to convene some kind of international conference. Maybe they will help Bashar Assad to go out peacefully, and hopefully that's that's going to be something that will will put an end to this chaos. But Israel has, at the moment, has no intention to be part of this uh, chaotic uh, situation. Let me turn to Iran for a minute. And, and you said in your remarks that, because a lot of people ask me, do you think President Obama uh, could um, you know, attack Iran if that's needed? And, you're, and the way I heard your remarks is, look, Israel's got to make its own decisions. The clocks might not be exactly synchronized. Uh, and, you know, Israel, and, and you cited President Obama, he has to have the right to defend itself by itself. Uh, I think everyone in this audience saw Prime Minister Netanyahu with a, a red marker draw that red line at the United Nations uh, General Assembly when he spoke last fall. Um, so I guess my question to you is, do you, when you read these IAEA reports, the International Atomic Energy Agency reports, saying that the amount of, of uranium gas has, has been dropped and has been converted into oxide powder. Um, and we've had our own debate in Washington, and, um, which I won't get into, uh, about these red lines. But some have said in Israel, when I was there in March, Iran has internalized our red line. Do you feel that sense of confidence about the Iranians that, that with them diverting some of that gas and the powder that they, Israel drew a line and Iran will respect that line? Or do you see it as a more of a temporary move of Iran trying to manipulate Netanyahu's red line? Well, the Iranians are very close to being genius. They're very sophisticated. And what they do is whenever a red line is being painted, drawn, they never cross the red line in a blunt way. What they do is they, they take this line and they cut it to 100 little pinky lines. And they cross one pinky line and another and another. And then you find yourself looking back and say, hey, where is the red line? But they never crossed any red line. And it's not funny. This is a strategy that is working. It's working for 15 years. I began being engaged in this fight between the world and Iran around 15 years ago when I was a cabinet minister, a justice minister in Netanyahu's uh, cabinet. By the way, then he came to the American Congress and gave a speech that nobody remembers, but he was one of the first leaders, few leaders in the world that characterized this strategy of Iran in front of the American Congress. It was in 1978, uh, 1997. And since then, I'm, I'm watching the way they work uh, is in my various capacities and these various ministries and five, last five years, the head of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. This is what they do. And they do it in a, in a way that you never catch them. But since the world understood it several years ago, so we have all those reports of the IAEA describing the severe violations of the NPT uh, regulations, and we have these United Nations resolutions forcing them to, uh, to stop their program, and of course they don't even think of uh, complying. And we're getting closer and closer to the point of no return. What is the point of no return? Netanyahu described it. They'll have enough enriched uranium to be able to produce the bomb. So there is now a debate. I don't know if so many people are into this technology of whether they, they did cross the red line or not. It's, it's not very important because decisions should be made this year, no later than the beginning of uh, 2014, and I believe, as I said, that Israel's future 
cannot be dependent on others, even on our best allies. We never asked American soldiers to fight for us. We fought for our, our existence since 1948. Luckily, we have the United States as our best ally, and we wouldn't be able maybe to survive without the help, without the money, without the military assistance, without the backing in the UN, without the planes and the bombs and the tanks and everything that we get. But still, we don't want nobody to spill his blood for us. If we will have to confront Iran, it should be our mission and our responsibility. Okay, Tzachi, I'm gonna now ask you one domestic question and then turn it open to the, to the audience. Uh, our audience might not be familiar uh, because they don't follow all the ins and outs of Israeli politics, but Tzachi Negbi is, I guess if you had to put it in, uh, as people know I like baseball terms, is the ninth inning closer, the, the, the person who you have to cut the deal in terms of the coalition, it's Tzachi Negbi. He's, he's a rare bird that he loves foreign policy issues and that way would be more like a wonk as we would call it in Washington. But yet, when it comes to sheer raw politics, he's the fixer. The person, Netanyahu says, Tzachi, close it. You know, get it done for me and finalize the cabinet. Um, so I guess my question to you is to ask you about the durability of this government, because we get this question in Washington all the time. And we know that Mr. Bennett, who's the head of one party, and Mr. Netanyahu have had their differences in the past. Uh, for example, we have a new phenomenon of Yair Lapid. So I guess we're wondering how durable is this, especially since we think Mr. Netanyahu, if he had his druthers, would like to have the ultra-Orthodox back in his coalition. Will there be a law in Israel in the coming month or two, apart from the budget, that would legislate that the ultra-Orthodox of Israel have to uh, serve in the army in an incremental fashion and also be integrated into to the workforce. How is that going to happen politically, in your view? Did you mention something about baseball? Yeah. OK. <laughs> I am not aware of the baseball uh, characteristics. If it would be soccer, I would be able to relate. So I don't know if I was insulted or complimented. <laughs> it was a compliment. Uh, it was a compliment. OK, thank you. <laughs> but uh, uh, David, uh, is really a good friend. We haven't seen each other for many years, but back, he kept his, his curls. I had curls back in <laughs> 1978. Your, your hair was much longer than mine in the student days. <laughs> in those radical days, it was fun to work with uh, David, and I know that he follows everything that's happening in Israel, and he just touched on one of the most crucial, sensitive, and vital issues in Israel, which is the... Uh, the demand of so many Israelis that everybody will carry the burden when it comes to military service. I can relate to this demand. I was uh, in the paratroopers, and my sons are now, I have twins, one in the paratroopers, another in the, you can explain to them what Golani is, maybe people know what Golani is, is, is not, is exactly as good as the paratroopers unit. No, 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 not even better. <laughs> and I see when these people, these kids come back home and I see their friends and I talk to them, I see the animosity that they have not towards the parties or towards the rabbi, but towards Judaism. Because for them, it's like equals. Being Jewish means being religious, means somebody who doesn't share the burden with us. And that's very bad, because this is how young people can unfortunately think that this is something that separates them from, from Jewish values, and that's a big danger. So for many years, this was part of all the coalition agreements since Ben-Gurion was the, the prime minister. It was a big mistake, but this mistake was prolonged and prolonged, and now, Israeli public voted for a party who made it in, in the, the heart of their agenda, Yair Lapid's party, uh, Yesh Atid, there is a future. 
and they got a lot of power and they were able to really dictate to the prime minister that the nature of the new government will not include the religious, the, ortho, the ultra-orthodox, because this change must be implemented. I believe that it will be implemented because it does reflect the, the will of 80%, 85% of, of Israelis. The best thing, of course, is to do it in, in a consensus and not in a way that is being uh, imposed upon the young religious uh, guys, but we will try to put it forward. We're now working. There's a committee in the Knesset uh, and one in the government trying to formulate the new legislation. Hopefully, it will be passed this year and it will be implemented and we will be able to see everybody trying to share the burden like it should be. And the government being durable, in your view, the coalition? The coalition is harmonious. Uh, as you know, every coalition begins harmonious and then <laughs> it, it's not. Unfortunately, we don't have the American way and uh, we have this parliamentarian regime or system or structure, structure that has many faults that you all know. By the way, we are trying also to take advantage of the fact that the coalition is harmonious now in order to also change the way the government works and to give it much more uh, uh, stability and endurance and to work four years and then go to the elections. But if you ask me whether it's possible, it's possible. We have young Orthodox in the army already in, a, in two regiments that are called Netzach Yehuda, the uh, eternal Jude, Judea. They are as fighters as everyone else and they're doing their best to serve the country. They are being drafted not for a whole uh, term of three years, but less. But so also are the, the, the national religious yeshivot also do not go for three years, but for sometimes half of it. There is progress, and I'm optimistic about this direction. By the way, I, I looked into uh, who was David Ben-Gurion's negotiator with the, with the Chazonish, who was a leading ultra-Orthodox figure in, in 1948. <laughs> the closer then, the fixer then, was not a guy named Tzachia Negbi. He was a 24-year-old guy. Who, who saw in the Chazonish and the ultra-Orthodox leadership his own grandfather. And it was a, a young guy named Shimon Peres. <laughs> and, and now I saw with the coalition negotiations that the ultra-Orthodox came to him and pled with, pleaded with him that he should take control. But now he is about to celebrate his 90th birthday, this 24-year-old. So this is an issue that has been part of Israel since its inception. And maybe now we hope uh, it is on its way to a resolution we shall see. So with that, why don't I turn it over to the floor and see if uh, questions. Yeah, but right there. Uh, Richard Abramson. Hello? Yeah. yeah, hello. I have a question on, uh, you talked about Palestinian uh, and the peace process. How do you deal with Hamas? How do you deal with Gaza? Uh, who do you talk to in terms of a peace process and, and, and make that go forward? There are three approaches. One says, let's not deal at the moment with the, with the Hamas issue. Let's reach an agreement with the Abu Mazen, with the Palestinian Authority. And once the agreement is, uh, is ready or signed, it's not going to be implemented till there will be uh, an agreement to go, that the Palestinians will go for elections in Gaza also. And if the Hamas will lose and the moderate camp will uh, prevail, it means that they are accepting all the ideas and, and they will, of course, have to agree that Hamas will, be, uh, will not exist anymore as a military force and this is one approach. So tell the Palestinians, okay, you have an agreement on the counter waiting for you to make a decision to disassociate themselves from the forces of violence and terrorism, and only then such an agreement can be implemented. Another approach says the Hamas should be included in the talks 
because they are representing at least half of the Palestinian people. And they will eventually, if they would go into the talks, they will have to accept the three um, conditions of the quartet, namely to recognize Israel, to disassociate from incitement and uh, violence, and to uh, be ready to implement all the agreements, past agreements between Israel and the Palestinian Authority with the PLO. At the moment, they do not accept uh, this idea, and it's a non-starter. And there is a third uh, school of thought that is based on many things that s several Hamas leaders have said, like the current one, Khaled Mashal, that uh, said that they are ready to a hudna. A hudna meaning a truce of 30 years, which will not include uh, an agreement about the end of the conflict and the, the end of mutual claims and many things will stay for the next generation to, uh, to decide upon, but at least they will be able to be part of, of uh, an independent state and Israel will have an agreement that will be accepted. So I guess that the American effort now will try to find which one of the various uh, options is more feasible and we will see in the, in the future what's the way, the best way to deal with the Hamas. Because you cannot ignore the fact that Hamas exists, but you cannot reach an agreement with an organization who's, who swore to erase you of the face of the earth. But if you don't deal with the way the Palestinians are made now, you mean there's, there's no more logic in negotiation, and we believe that there is a logic in negotiation. So this is the, the dilemma that you have just mentioned. Next question, Rob Satloff. Thank you, and Saki, thank you very much for your remarks. I thought they were really excellent. I, I do want to ask you about the, um, the comment that would probably make headlines in Israel concerning, you know, should Israel let America uh, act on Iran or not, Israel should act for itself. Um, because I'm, I'm not sure as an American that, that I would have characterized the question the way you as an Israeli characterized the question. Because you characterize the question as should, uh, should Israel ask America to act for Israel or should Israel act on its own? But Americans look at the Iran issue or many Americans say it's not an Israel issue. It is an American issue. It's a global issue. Iran threatens not just Israel, but Iran threatens America, our allies, our interests, more generally. And so it's not just will Israel ask America to act for Israel, it's really if the two sides do have two timetables, as you suggested, and each is acting in its own set of interests, will Israel wait for America to act on its timetable? Will it have the confidence that America will act on its timetable? It's a very different way to look at it, but I think that's the way, if I were the President of the United States, that's, that's how I would have responded to your comment. And I'd appreciate, no, I'm not the President of the United States, <laughs> as my wife will tell you. <laughs> yeah. But I would appreciate your response to how an American leader, I think, would respond to your comment. Well, you begin with a compliment, and then you put a trap for me. <laughs> <coughs> but I see it, so I'm not going to work into it. <laughs> but I totally agree with you that Iran is not an Israeli issue, and Iran is also preventing Iran from being nuclear is American interest, that's what the president and the previous one and the previous one have all committed. But the question is, what will happen when we get to the end of our timetable? Because as I've mentioned, the United States has an ability to be more patient. Because of the way uh, the United States Army is, uh, is made of. We don't have so much, we're not an empire. So when we 
feel that we are getting to, uh, to, to the time where we have to use the last resort, it's probably not representing or reflecting on the way the American uh, leadership will think. So being very careful, I don't want to add it. That's all. Thank you. Okay. W Wendy Schreiber. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to the, um, the effect of Salam Fayyad leaving the administration and the Palestinian Authority. What um, the Israelis see the effect of that and how the Palestinians view that. And also, if there was ever such a time as there might be an election within the PA, um, is there anyone on the landscape that poses uh, some positive, strong leadership for the Palestinians? I don't want to harm Salam Fayyad, so I'm not going to elaborate on his skills, but I just want to say I met, met him several times. I think that he's a man of peace. I think that he means what he says. I think that he is totally against uh, violence and terror, not because this is the bon ton, but this is what he understands is causing so much tragedies to his own people. And it's, I hope that he will be back in the picture. What happened there is really an internal issue that we make sure we, we don't really want to comment on, but I think that if he'll be back in the picture, it will be good for both sides. There are um, genuine young Palestinian leaders in the PLO camp, in the, in the pragmatic camp that we, are, we can deal with. We have many uh, ties with many of them, uh, not in secret manner, but publicly. They participate in many events that are international and also in, in Israel and in Ramallah. So I think that there, is, there are leaders that we can work with in the Palestinian camp. But of course, as, as many that are experienced, like Salam Fayyad, are there, it's, it's, be, it's for the best. Do you, uh, just to follow that up, Wendy's question, um, I mean, mea culpa, I wrote a, a piece where I felt that Fayyad was scapegoated internally because he didn't want to go to the UN, and then the money didn't come, and, uh, and then he was blamed internally, and he was scapegoated when he was against the move to the UN. But do you also believe that um, even if you say that he was a victim of an intrigue in, in, within the Palestinian camp, do you think there's some need in Israel um, for a cheshbon nefesh also? I mean, for someone like him, some reflection, some introspection to say, maybe withholding the money, uh, we hurt the guy we want to help and we help the guys we wanted to hurt. Do you think that the whole episode, the saga of Fayadism, which was this idea of trying to create an ethnic reliance in the Palestinian side that Fayad represented, accountability, not the ethos of victimhood put forward by Yasser Arafat, that that whole episode leads Israeli policymakers to think, maybe next time we have to think a bit differently? Well, I don't want to go into the blame game, but I think that we lost four precious years because of a big mistake that was contributed to by the American administration, the maybe naivety or uh, less of understanding at the beginning of the Obama's term and about the way they should uh, place themselves in this Israeli-Palestinian uh, dialogue. I was in the opposition, as you know, for, for, for several years during the first term of Netanyahu in nine, 2009, and I was amazed at the progress, at the change that he made, ex uh, accepting the idea of two-state solution and imposing upon his 
followers the idea of moratorium. And I think that the Palestinians should have taken advantage immediately when it happened. It was an amazing change in, in the Israeli ideology, not only in the Israeli political uh, uh, behavior. It was a big mistake. I don't think Israel is to blame. I think that Likud, as you know, Likud lost a lot of voters now to the uh, Bennett's party. And I heard the young Israeli, right-wing Israelis that were debating whether to vote for Netanyahu or to vote for uh, this upcoming leader that is the head of the, the old uh, NRP, the National Religious Party, with the new face, it's called the Jewish House now. And they said, we, are, we cannot support Netanyahu because Netanyahu is for uh, a two-state solution and he's he ruined us for 10 months and he brought disaster in the, in the settlement in Judea and Samaria for 10 months. They're not people who are too far to the right. But we lost them. And we lost them because Netanyahu, Netanyahu took a risk. And this risk maybe cost him six, seven mandates in the last elections. And he knew it might happen. But unfortunately, this gesture, this courageous move was not uh, answered by the other side. Some, I mean, just on the, the political calculations, I mean, some were saying that Netanyahu and Lieberman together were 42 seats, yet they were 31. You might say half of them were lost to Bennett. Where did the other half go? I mean, what was it about to Lapid? Lapid. And what, what was his appeal? How did he attract Likud voters who were more faithful to Netanyahu? The, the, the way the religious parties were perceived is that they exist thanks to the generosity of the establishment. It used to be Labour Party, now it was Likud, which is in a way true. We didn't change the legislation concerning the, uh, the army when we were in power. So many Israelis, young people, voted for Lapid also uh, with the same weight because of the economical issue, the social protest, the the housing issue, many other issues. Altogether, I think we we lost ten mandates, like six or seven of them to Lapid, and three or four to the religious party. Before I call on Stanley Tate for the next question, just on economics, because a lot of our trustees are are interested in this issue. You know, the, you you could say that while Israel might not be cohesive right now it's harmonious but maybe not cohesive in terms of its outlook on the Palestinians you have people some like Bennett some like Livni different different philosophies but maybe on the issue of economics uh, that you have three people at the top Prime Minister Netanyahu Bennett and Lapid that I think you could describe them as having a more uh, comprehensive neoliberal philosophy of, of free trade and how is Israel going to change economically over the next four years with these three people at the top? How is Israel going to change? Are the, is it going to be on the backs of the unions? Is the, the ports going to work different hours so that Israeli goods will, will be cheaper? Because as you said, there were 400,000 people that came to the streets in the summer of 2011. So what's going to change? Maybe you know that the Israeli government is about to decide next Monday about uh, cu budget cuts that will probably be the most uh, dramatic budget cuts in history. We have to do it because we need to make sure that we keep our, uh, our status in the OECD and in other uh, in the other economical, international economical forums. The budget that will be br brought to the government will be the end of 2013 and 2014 altogether. The budget is made of 304.5 uh, billion shekels, which means that there is a little growth, but not as much as we would like to have in the next two or three years. What we will do is first we're going to be harsh on ourselves, government uh, will have to stop hiring new people. There will be uh, uh, cutting also in, in manpower. Tax, uh, income tax will be raised in 1%. Companies tax will be uh, raised in 1%. Uh, 
uh, exemptions uh, in tax system will be uh, canceled. We will have to cut the this defense cut budget by four billion shekels. Ministers will not uh, will not be able to go abroad as much as before. So if you want me here, you'll have to uh, <laughs> make sure that right. you bring me here. Yeah. And uh, and we are we are going to do a very problematic job now for for many Israelis. But next year and the year afterwards, we're going to implement the reforms that Netanyahu for many years dreamed to and didn't have the harmonious coalition that will be able to do it. Now we feel that we have a consensus in the government that these things can be done. You spoke about uh, the unions, the ports, and the transportation infrastructure, many things we believe uh, the, the time is ripe for us to go forward with them. So altogether, I believe that the direction is going to be very good, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. Stanley Tate. No, here, it's right, right behind you. Thank you. Suzaki, I wonder if you might comment, moving away from the political manifestations for a moment, and talk about whether or not, because it appeared as if America was leaning towards a containment pos position, and Israel felt that in their interest they had to move whether or not definitive arrangements have been made with the United States military to have them aware of what Israel is going to need in order to bring about an attack on Iran without American troops, but with American support. Has the support been outlined and delineated, and has it been committed to by the United States? <laughs> Yeah, easy questions. Huh? Yes, very easy. If you would be a reporter, I would say no comment. <laughs> Since you're no reporter, I'll tell you, come to Israel, let's meet, and we'll discuss this issue. <laughs> <laughs> right over there. Hi, I'm Emil Baroudi with Al Mayajin TV. I am a reporter. Say it, say it just louder, I couldn't hear you. Emil Baroudi with Al Mayajin TV. And I was telling him that I am a reporter. Okay. Uh, while the, the land swap uh, issue can be probably, uh, could you could convince the Arab, uh, the Palestinians of it for technical reason or whatever. There is another issue that Israelis talk about, but um, which is the Jewish character of Israel. How, how do you see this? How do you plan to convince the Arabs of it? And how does it play in the, in the long term peace process? And explain why this has become such an important issue for Prime Minister Netanyahu. It is an important issue. I don't think that it's only for Netanyahu. I think that every Israeli asks himself, are we going to reach an agreement that will postpone the problem, but is not really going to uh, reflect on the historic compromise that is needed for both th sides to adopt and to digest and to live with. The compromise that we are making, I think, is now more clear to objective uh, commentators. I grew up in a house that, uh, that my mother and father were both fighters for the underground. I read something that my mother wrote, but she, correct, she was not a minority. Every Israeli, almost every Israeli understands that we really didn't come back to our country only because of the cities of Haifa or Tel Aviv or Rishon LeZion. Jews kept their connection to Israel and to Zion because of where the country was really uh, the birthplace of country. We see Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and also other areas like the Bashan and Gilad and Moab and Choran that we don't talk about anymore because they are part of Jordan and we understand that reality changed. So if we are demanded 
to disassociate ourselves from the dream of greater Israel and from the linkage and connection and s profound roots in most of Judea and Samaria, we want to make sure that the Palestinians disassociate themselves from their dream of going back to Akko and Haifa and Tel Aviv. And this is where the two peoples understand that this is their the end of the dream, but the beginning of normal and sane and prosperous life in two states living side by side and in peace and security. So for Netanyahu, it's essential to make sure that when we sign the final agreement, he will be, he will be able to answer himself, because he also grew up in such an environment of, of need to make sure that we're not making a very big mistake. And I think that the meaning of Israel is a Jewish state is not that no Arabs can live in Israel. We have 20% of our population are Arabs. But the identity of the country, the, I would say, the, yeah, the, the character the character of the country is Jewish. And it's not offending anybody. And the Palestinian state will have their own decision about whatever they want the character of Palestine to be. If Palestinians cannot accept this idea, if cannot sign an agreement that is accepting these two states for two people, it's not two-state solution. Many Palestinians say two-state solution, but in their heart, it's not two states for two people. For our, for Israel, is two states for two people, the Palestinian people and the Jewish people. And I think it's not a demand that is not unaccept cannot be accepted. Well, well, thank you very much, Tzachi. And I must say that with all the austerity budget that uh, Israel faces, we'll be very happy for you to return as our guest and to come visit us again at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Thank you very much for coming. We're very grateful. <laughs>